Whether you are bringing together a multi-million dollar defense system or a simple electronic sub-assembly, it is very important to make the proper connection. And making the connection properly depends on you. But before we begin, there is an interesting story behind the modern day connector we think you will enjoy. It all began back in the 40s. Then, connecting two wires was a simple process of soldering. However, removing and reconnecting those wires for testing or replacement of components was not as simple a process. The solution to that problem gave birth to the modern day connector. By the 50s, the connector evolved into a multi-pin system. The 60s saw the addition of several connector series that would support the ever-growing aerospace industry. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh... Oh, jeez. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're <laughs> and the 70s hosted connectors that married computers to sophisticated military systems. In the 80s, the mixture of multi-function connectors carry electricity and light of almost every kind the mind can imagine. Satellites, space shuttles, telephone telemetry, tanks, aircraft, and computers. Somehow, Someone has to make the connection. With this ever-growing and complex industry comes a special challenge, the assembly of the interconnection system itself. How do we then make this system come to life? The connector has, in fact, become a system in itself. Contacts of almost every shape and size. Insertion and removal of contacts. the complete replacement of sub-assemblies of all kinds, and of course, the assembly of new cable harnesses with many different types of connectors. In fact, we might consider these types of cables and harnesses the spinal cord of the electronic system. The proper assembly of connectors, or as we have come to know them, connector systems, then becomes an important and critical success factor. During this evolutionary process in the circular connector arena, similar development has occurred in areas such as the rectangulars, D subminiatures, and other connectors. The motivating factors behind the new designs are greater density, lighter weight components, faster assembly techniques, and better serviceability. With a general ability to identify connectors it's time to discuss the all-important topic of identification of contacts. The contact, as we know, can be either a pin or a socket. The specification created by the military to standardize contacts to be used in military connectors is MIL-C39029. MIL-C39029 was developed to standardize certain performance and design characteristics to establish standard test methods and to identify contacts with a uniform color code system. This color code system is referred to as the BIN code. BIN stands for Basic Identification Number. From this BIN code, we are able to identify the contact number, then by use of charts, determine its exact specification. For example, look at this contact. How do you read the color bands? The bands represent digits which make up the code. Each color is a one digit number. Let's look at the color chart. Now once you know the color scheme or have a chart, you always start with the color closest to the end of the contact where the wire enters. That will be the first digit. The next two digits are read in order and make up the complete bin code. Once again, this bin code will lead us to the appendix charts in MIL-C39029, which will give us the size, electrical specs, and the family of connectors in which the contact is used. 
With this pertinent information, we will be able to select the tools for proper connector assembly. Making the proper connection is essential in integrating the complete system. Now we will examine the use of connector tools. Connector tools used for wire preparation and crimping. We will cover them as follows. First, selection and preparation of wire. Then, how to crimp contacts. Let's get right into our first section, the selection and preparation of wire. Wire is a conductor which carries electricity such as conventional voltage, digital pulses, analog control voltages, or microwave signals. Wire comes in many configurations, but the most common is a conductor covered with insulation. The more common conductors come with either a solid conductor or stranded conductor. The size of the conductor, as you well know, is referred to as the gauge, sometimes abbreviated as AWG, which stands for American Wire Gauge. The smaller the gauge number, the larger the wire's physical diameter. Conductors are made of various types of metals. The most popular conductor is copper. In high reliability applications, the conductors are plated with metals such as silver, tin, or nickel. Wire insulation is made up of different materials for particular environments. Teflon, Kapton, Kynar, PVC, and nylon are a few. And the most basic purpose of insulation is simply to separate conductors electrically. The thickness of the insulation can be an important factor affecting installing and removal tool performance. In the final analysis, the all-important selection of wire and insulation type is application dependent. Preparing wire begins with cutting the wire to the proper length. Be sure the cut is clean in preparation for stripping. Wire stripping is the process of removing a precise amount of insulation from the end of the wire that is to be terminated. When stripping wire to be placed in a connector contact barrel, a specified strip length is important. The most dependable source for strip length is the contact manufacturer's literature. If this reference is not available, it is generally acceptable to adjust the strip length so that when the wire bottoms in the wire barrel, a gap of 1 64th to 1 32nd of an inch is maintained between the top of the contact and the insulation. Although there are many different designs of wire strippers, we can basically divide them into four categories. The single blade type are usually referred to as rotary strippers, which get their name from rotating the blade around the wire. Next, the double blade strippers, which are comprised of two opposing blades that have precisely machined cavities that encircle the wire. Then, thermal strippers, which melt the insulation. And finally, abrasive wire strippers, which remove hard insulation, such as enamel, by grinding. Let us examine the double blade wire stripper, which is commonly used in high reliability applications. Notice there are different cavities for the various gauge wires. Let's watch the operator carefully place this 16 gauge wire in its proper location. When the handles are squeezed, the linkage first closes the blades around the wire, then grips the wire in a vice-like fashion, while the double blades cut through the insulation. As the handles are closed further, the gripper and the blades move in opposing directions, resulting in the insulation being stripped from the wire. These type of wire strippers can be outfitted with various attachments to enhance its operation. Here we have attached a wire stop. This is used to provide a positive method of controlling uniform strip lengths. It is adjusted to the desired position and locked in place. Another option is the latch mechanism, which allows the operator to cut and separate the insulation, but not remove it from the end of the wire. This prevents stranded wire from being frayed when the wire is being pre-stripped for termination in a later operation or in a different location. As shown here, the slug is easily removed when desired. It is now very important to carefully inspect the stripped wire. This should be done under magnification. A simple five power glass should be sufficient. First, we make sure the insulation separation is performed completely and uniformly by the wire stripper. 
Here's an example of insulation which was not stripped properly. Notice the ragged separation. This indicates the wire was stripped in a cavity which was too large for that particular wire size. Here we show a properly stripped wire which exhibits a clean, straight separation. If the cavity is too small for the particular wire size, damage in the form of plating degradation, nicked strands and even broken strands may occur. These conditions result in a compromise of the wire strength and corrosion resistance. Please note, different stripper blades are recommended for the various insulation types. The wire stripper manufacturer should be consulted for the correct combinations. Another popular style stripper is the thermal stripper. When using thermal wire strippers, make sure that while melting, wire insulation is not coating the exposed conductor with a thin layer of insulation material. Also, the insulation which is left on the wire should not be discolored or significantly embrittled by the heated blades. That concludes the selection and preparation of wire. Let's move on to the next logical step in the connector assembly, attaching the wire to the contact. It is generally accepted that the most reliable method of attaching a contact to a wire is crimping. The process of crimping offers improved uniformity when terminating the wire to the contact. This results in higher repeatability, hence higher reliability. What is crimping? Crimping is the method of firmly attaching the contact to a wire by pressure forming or reshaping a metal barrel of the contact together with the conductor. This is accomplished by the use of a crimp tool. Typically, a crimp tool is comprised of two basic parts, a tool frame chosen for a particular wire size and a positioning head chosen for the particular contact to be crimped. The tool frame is somewhat universal, while there can be thousands of heads for one tool frame. In an effort to standardize crimp tools, Mill C22520 was created by the military. Basic crimp tool frames and heads, as well as other accessories, are defined therein. For crimping single conductor contacts, generally referred to as power contacts, there are three basic crimp tool frames. These crimp tool frames are commonly referred to as indent type crimp tools. This name is derived from the four opposing dies, which are called indenters. They create four symmetrical imprints around the contact wire barrel. The distinction between the three crimp tool frames is the wire sizes they will accommodate. The correct crimp tool is selected using Mill C39029 or the manufacturer's reference guide to suit the desired contact. Let us now find out how to crimp. First, look at the M22520-01-01 basic crimp tool frame. This is a precision instrument. Therefore, calibration should be periodically verified. This is accomplished by use of an inspection gauge. First, select the appropriate gauge using the crimp tool manufacturer's recommendations, or Mill C22520. Next, look at the instructions printed on the gauge for the proper selector knob position. Then fully close the crimp tool. Now we test the tool by inserting the go gauge pin between the indenters. The go gauge pin is indicated by green. This should slide freely between the indenters. And finally, attempt to insert the no-go gauge pin between the indenters. The no-go gauge pin is indicated by red and should not pass between the indenters. Caution, do not under any circumstances crimp the gauge pins. This crimp tool utilizes a contact positioning head which is called a turret head. This head derives its name from the indexable turret, which allows the operator to select from one of three positions. Each position is designed for a different contact size. The function of the head is to position the contact with respect to the indenters and lists the appropriate crimp depth setting for the various size wires on the data plate. The turret head is attached as follows. A guide pin positions the head radially. Then the socket cap screws are tightened. 
The next step is to refer to the data plate. This is where the contact number is located. We now index the turret head to the proper position called out on the data plate. Red, blue, yellow, etc. In this case, it is blue. Now we depress the turret until it latches in position. The turret head may be locked in place with a spring clip or safety wire. Next, we go back to the data plate and determine where we set the selector knob. This setting is found where the wire size column crosses with the contact size row. Now we simply open the tool frame as follows. Raise the selector knob and rotate it to the proper number. This varies the crimp depth which determines the amount the contact barrel is crimped on the wire. This can also be locked in place with a spring clip or safety wire. We are now ready to crimp. Place the contact in the tool, making sure you point the wire barrel up and the mating end down. Then place the wire in the contact barrel. Another method equally acceptable is to place the contact on the wire and then insert both into the tool. Be sure all the wire strands are inside the wire barrel and the wire barrel and the wire is fully inserted. Now close the handle as far as possible. Notice the handle will not open until the crimping cycle is complete. This is due to the cycle control ratchet. When the cycle is complete, simply relax hand pressure and allow the tool to open. The crimped contact wire assembly may now be removed by lifting the wire from the tool. Let's take a close look. Notice the hole in the side of the contact wire barrel. This is called the inspection hole. The wire strands must be visible through this hole after crimping. When you can see the wire, you will be assured that the wire extends past the crimp area. A proper crimp is located midway between the inspection hole and the top of the wire barrel. If the crimp occurs in another location, the turret head may have been incorrectly selected for that contact or the operator has not inserted the contact properly. Also, check the wire insulation and be sure the insulation separation from the contact is within the specified tolerance. This is typically 1 64th to 1 32nd of an inch. Also, be sure no wire strands have been left out of the wire barrel. And finally, be sure to inspect the contact barrel for cracks in the plating material. Magnification may be required to make this inspection. Our next example of crimping is the miniature frame crimp tool. In this case, we attach a positioner to the tool. This performs the same function as the turret head. That is, it orients the contact with the indenters and gives the crimp depth setting for the particular wire size. We attach the positioner by inserting it into the basic frame and rotating it 90 degrees to the locked position. This may be locked into position by means of a spring clip or safety wire. Now we refer to the data plate for the proper selector number. Open the tool frame, raise the selector knob, and rotate it to the proper position. Lock it with a spring clip or safety wire. And now you are ready to crimp. Insert the contact and wire assembly then crimp. These are but a few examples of crimp tools available, and it is worth mentioning other types like the pneumatic crimp tool, which utilizes air pressure in place of manpower, and there are special purpose crimp tools, which you will discover as you continue to work in the ever-expanding world of connector systems. Once the contacts are crimped to the wires, it is time to install the assembly into the connector. All contacts are installed from the rear. Remember, contacts are either pins or sockets. It might be noted that the receptacle or plug may be set up to hold either pins or sockets. Notice the pin insert is recessed deeper than the socket insert. This is to protect the pins while the connectors are unmated. Before any contacts are installed into the connector, check to see if any back shell, strain relief, or other accessory 
will be fitted to the connector. These components must first be slipped over the wire bundle. A number of schemes are used to illustrate the contact number arrangement. In general, inserting contacts begins in the center of the insert, and then we work our way out. That is why it is important to familiarize yourself with the numbering scheme. Let us get right into installing a contact with its properly attached wire by first looking at installing tools. Although there are many sizes and designs of installing tools, they can be divided into two broad categories for the purpose of training. One, the channel type tool, where the contact rests in the channel, and a second type, which fully encompasses the contact. We will learn how to use a few popular types for a start. Here, we make the assumption the proper installing tool has been selected per mill C39029, or selected from a chart supplied by the connector tool manufacturer. Another important military standard which was created to standardize the requirements and design of installing and removal tools is mill I81969. This spec includes the color codes assigned to the tools based on contact size. For example, yellow for size 12 contacts, blue for size 16, and red for size 20. Installing a contact is a simple procedure, but no less important than the more difficult steps in connector assembly. Let us begin with a channel type installing tool. The contact and wire assembly is placed in the tool as such. Notice how the assembly fits in the channel. Now we select the proper contact cavity and simply insert the contact as follows. Look at that procedure once again. Care must be taken with a connector which utilizes a rubber sealing grommet so as not to tear or otherwise damage the rubber and impair its sealing integrity. When the contact is fully seated, a snapping action will probably be felt and heard. Extracting the tool with a smooth motion in a straight line without rotation is necessary so as not to damage the rubber grommet or adjacent wires. Look at this cross-section diagram. Notice the contact is held in place by locking tines in one direction and by the configuration of the insert itself in the other direction. The system shown is utilized in most low to medium density connectors. This diagram illustrates another configuration of most high density connectors. Again, notice the contact is retained by a combination of locking tines and the insert shape. Here is an installing tool which encompasses the contact. Notice how the tip halves separate. The contact wire assembly is placed inside where it is grasped and fully supported when the tips are closed. As before, we select the correct cavity and we now simply insert the contact as shown. Listen again for the snap or click. Sometimes the snap is difficult to hear or feel, so testing for proper seating is done by lightly pulling on the wire after the tool is removed or by use of a retention test tool. The retention test tool is the desirable method since pulling on the wire is not recommended by some connector manufacturers or by process standards. The retention test tool is placed on the front of the connector and mated with the individual contact. This allows the operator to apply a predetermined spring pressure. A properly seated contact will remain in place. An improperly seated contact will be pushed backwards, indicating to the operator that it must be removed and installed properly. Let us look at a few different configurations of connector tools, which perform the same task.
Just a quick note about another style of a connector tool made entirely of plastic. This is a double-ended tool with an installing tip on one end and a removal tip on the other. Typically, the white end is for removal and the colored end is for installing. Notice how the tool flexes to allow the wire to be pushed into the tool. Note the end marked insert is placed on the wire and pushed forward until it is seated behind the contact shoulder. Align the contact with the selected cavity. Insert, maintain proper alignment. A snapping action may be heard and felt when the contact is fully seated. Withdraw the tool. One last point in this section. You may observe contacts that have been installed in the connector without wires attached. These unwired contacts in military systems are used for spare contacts for system upgrades. The positions left open for these spares will allow future system modifications without requiring the addition of connectors. It is a military requirement that the connectors be assembled with a full complement of contacts. Installing unwired contacts is done in the same manner as a wired contact assembly. However, it will take a bit of practice to insert these unwired contacts since there is no wire which offers stability. You may have to hold the contacts with your hand in certain cases, but it will not be long before you develop a successful technique. In systems where strict environmental conditions exist, each hole in the connector grommet must be sealed, and this is done with a plastic sealing plug. Typically, a few sealing plugs are supplied in these type environmental connectors by the manufacturer. As you can see, installing contacts is a simple process, yet it is very important you follow the correct procedures and develop good habits when installing contacts. There are conditions when improper installation of contacts must be remedied as well as other situations which leads us to our next topic of interest removal of contacts <laughs> removing contacts is an everyday part of dealing with the modern day connector the complexity of systems with ever improving specifications as well as field connector repairs mean changes. These changes will most often result in removing contacts for update or repair. The most popular connector styles utilize either front or rear contact release designs. In the early 70s, a blue band was added to signify the connector as a rear release connector. The absence of a color band typically indicates that either the connector is a front release design or that it has non-removable contacts. Color bands other than blue on the connector shell have other meanings which do not apply to the release method. Remember, selecting the proper removal tool is absolutely necessary. Refer to MIL C39029 or another reliable source of tool application information. And also remember the color code system for connector tools designates contact gauge size, as we previously mentioned. Let's start with the removal of front release contacts. First, we may observe on certain connectors a back shell or other accessory. This must be removed before you can proceed with removing contacts. In other cases, you may observe a compression ring which compresses the grommet for the purpose of maintaining specific environmental specifications. This ring must also be removed or loosened before we are able to proceed with removing contacts. Now to remove a contact. Here are a few examples of how to use front release connector tools. This front release removal tool is gently inserted over the contact from the front of the connector. It is very important to maintain straight alignment of the tool with the contact. If you do not, damage may occur to the tool, contact, or the connector. You then push the tool firmly over the contact 
until it bottoms in the connector. A snap or click should be heard and felt. The plunger is now moved forward in the tool, pushing the contact out the rear. The tool is then extracted in a straight line out of the connector. Look at what occurs inside the connector. The removal tool spreads the tines, releasing the contact, enabling the plunger to push the contact out of the grasp of the tines. The wire in contact can now be fully removed. Now let us look at another example of a front release connector tool. Insert the removal tool, listen for the snap or click. Be sure to keep the tool in line with the contact. Now push the plunger forward, this time with the palm of your hand. Finally, pull the wire contact assembly completely out. Note the difference in the mechanics of the plunger. On the first tool we utilized, the plunger is actuated by pushing a slide located toward the front of the tool, whereas in the second example, the plunger is pushed forward from the back of the tool. Remember, these are only two examples of front release removal tools, and there are many others which you may become familiar with. Now let's look at the removal of rear release contacts. Remember, a rear release connector generally has a blue band around the outside of the shell as we observe here. Now look closely at this rear release tool. Notice how the tip separates. This enables us to place the tool around the wire. The wire then guides the tool to the contact as follows. Now we carefully align the removal tool over the contact wire barrel and with a small amount of pressure applied, in line with the contact, we push the tool forward until it bottoms in the connector. The tool is then gripped simultaneously with the wire. At this point, be sure not to change the position of the tool with respect to the contact. The tool, the wire, and the contact are now extracted by pulling them in a straight line away from the connector without rotation. This is how we use a removal tool for rear release contacts. Let's repeat that procedure, and this time pay close attention to the position of the operator's hand during each step. First, open the tool. Next, place it on the wire. Move the tool forward. Notice the hand is moved to a comfortable position midpoint on the tool. Align the tool with the contact. Push until the tool bottoms in the connector. The operator's fingers are already in a position which allows easy gripping of the wire without changing position on the tool. Now remove the wire, contact, and tool. Develop good habits and your efforts will pay off. As previously demonstrated, here is a rear release connector tool made entirely of plastic. As you will remember, the white end is typically used for removal of contacts. Again, Notice how the tool flexes to allow the wire to be pushed into the tool. Note the end marked extract is placed on the wire and the forward action is completed. The tool is gripped in the center around the wire where gripping teeth are provided to hold the wire in position. This secures the wire for easy removal. But what goes on inside the connector? Let's see. Notice the delicate retention tines. Some tines are plastic and some are metal, but both work the same way. These lock the contact in place. In the removal process, we must unlock the contact, and this occurs when the removal tool is pushed over the contact as follows. See how the removal tip opens the tines. Watch again. The tines are open to a diameter greater than the contact's shoulder. This, of course, enables the contact to be pulled rearward 
and removed. And that is what occurs inside the connector. If you recall in one of our previous discussions, unwired contacts are used in some connector applications. Removing unwired front release contacts is not a problem since we push the contact from the front of the connector. But in the case of rear release contacts, we have no wire to pull the contact out of the connector. This developed the need for a separate tool to remove unwired contacts in rear released connectors. Look at how this special tool operates. The sealing plug is removed. Then the tip of the tool is carefully inserted into the rear of the connector. The top of the contact's wire barrel will generally stop the tool. Here, a slight correction of alignment will allow you to slip the tool over the contact barrel to the shoulder where we once again hear and feel a snapping action. Now the contact may be removed by pulling in a straight line away from the connector. And now the contact, which is retained in the tip, can be released by pushing the plunger forward like this. And that is how we remove unwired contacts in rear release connectors. This concludes our lesson on removal tools. Now you have experienced an important step in the assembly of the connector system, the use of crimp tools. Your diligent efforts to properly select and prepare wire as well as crimp contacts may have a direct bearing on the success of life manned systems. You play an important role in making the connections.